Mark Joyce, thank you so much for taking the time out on a Saturday to come on the podcast. I really do appreciate your time. Right, yeah, thanks for asking me, yeah. No worries. So, yeah, just back from the Masters, um, the result didn't go the way that you wanted, but I was very impressed with your, your seats for the match that you sent us, mind. That was uh, watching um, MK Dons play. That was a pretty good a pretty good seat. Yeah, I, uh, when I booked the hotel room, I um, actually looked at the fixtures and I saw MK Dons were playing on the night, so I just I paid the extra tenner or whatever it was just for the upgrade <laughs> to, get a, to get a pitch view, but... Uh, yeah, they, they, they're putting a poor performance, to be fair. Uh, um, they lost one else. So, um, yeah, but uh, never mind. So we um we are bang in the middle of a, a lockdown mark now. Games being played with no crowd. How's um how's been playing during lockdown with no crowd? It kind of affected you. Do you prefer the buzz of the crowd or? Uh, I know a few people that I've spoken to, like uh, like Elliot and stuff that that say that they don't mind not having a crowd there. How do you feel about that? Um, to be honest, I think uh, sort of as a low rank player, I think you kind of get used to, you sort of used to playing without crowds as well. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think probably affect it probably affects the, 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 the top players more so I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you've just got to try and kind of kid yourself really when you get out there in, in the match arena, you've kind of just got to sort of imagine this sort of like somebody watching you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, how's it been um, practicing as well? Because obviously you've said that you've got. Do you have your own snooker room uh, where you live, or do you have to kind of travel to? to, to I've a actually uh, about six months ago I had um, a snooker room built at my parents' house. Nice. Uh, I'm, I'm in there at the minute. I don't know if you can see behind me. Just yeah, a little, a little glimpse of it. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm quite lucky to be honest in terms of practicing. Yeah. Um, Having said that, it's sort of I've been doing quite a lot of solo stuff lately, and mm -hmm. um, just sort of being careful who you sort of mix with and, and things. Yeah, no, I um, so you know, I think that sort of showed this week at the the the, the German Masters. Um, I was just just sort of well short where where I need to be in terms of sort of match practice, really. To be honest, how has lockdown been for you as well, Mark? Just in general, because I know you've got you've got young ones as well, and like uh, and other some people that you know that have to go out to practice as well. But now having one, like you say, being like somewhere that you can just go and practice, do you find just keeping your bubble small all the time, and like you say, keeping to yourself, but just like struggling to get match practice partners as well? That must be uh, a struggle, getting people to practice. Yeah, with. I think. Um... I think that's the biggest thing, really. You, the, like you can do six hours a day on your own every day, and you you, you sort of you, you're hitting the ball well. But at the end of the day, there's no substitute really for for sort of playing for playing games against other players. But particularly sort of probably match practice as well. Yeah, I think yeah. um, this week was the first sort of match I would played for seven weeks since I played in the Scottish um, the second week of December. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and it showed, to be honest, um, just didn't come out of the blocks. I think, to be honest, it was the same for both of us. I think Joe, Joe O'Connor, who I played, he was in the same boat as well. And I yeah. think, uh, I think it sort of showed with the standard. Really, it was uh, it was a scrappy stuff, and you know, um, unfortunately, I came out the, the wrong end of a decider. But um, yeah, I sort of going forward now. Hopefully, um, sort of get the kids back to school. In, in March, fingers crossed, and then mm. uh, it's all about the world, really. So, Mark Joyce, multiple amateur and uh, prom championships, uh, European under 19 champion, English Open, English amateur champion, pink ribbon, Vienna snooker champion um, on the main tour, multiple quarterfinals, and 2019 you made it to the Riga uh, final. Uh, a very impressive uh, list of credentials there, Mark. Where did it all start for you, mate? Uh, well, going back to the start, it was uh, I just had a sort of six foot table. Um, probably, probably the same sort of story as a lot of pros. To be fair, uh, I had a six foot table brought me for Christmas when I was about five or six. Um, sort of, my dad could sort of spot a bit of natural ability um, on that. And then when I was ten, he took me down the local um, labour club. Um, and it just sort of went from there, really. I started playing on the full-size table when I was 10. I had my first 100 when I was 12 and started beating the sort of local club players who had been playing for years. 
Um, I bet they I bet they really enjoyed a twelve year old coming in and doing that. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of them really because like, obviously I played in the I played for the local team, mm. so they, they sort of want you to to win when you're playing for the team. But when you when you're having a knock amongst yourself, you know, like you say, no no one wants to lose to a twelve year old. <laughs> Did you have anybody that you could practice with? Um, obviously, you showed natural ability straight away. But was there anybody pr- around your age? I mean, a lot of snooker players that I've spoke to said, unfortunately, um, when you have like that ex- that bit of talent, extra bit of talent that people don't have, it is they do find it very hard uh, to find practice partners that can at least push them. Well, I think at that age, it was just a matter of just playing for the the fun of it, really. Yeah. Just playing anybody anybody down the club who want, wanted to, wanted to play, really. Um, sort of. When I was sort of thirteen, uh, there was a local, um, a local guy who was actually on the board at the time called Jimmy Chambers, um, who who was manager of a snooker club in, in Warsaw Town Centre, um, which is sort of th- about three or four miles from where from where my parents' house is, um, and everyone was saying, you know, you, you need to get down there and um, play. And sort of, he did a Saturday morning junior club every. Uh, every Saturday morning for three or four hours, um, and it was just a natural progression. Really, I started going there, uh, winning the winning the junior tournaments there, and then um, and then it sort of went more sort of national. Then obviously ended up at Willie Thorns, where a lot of young junior snooker players uh, yeah. end up. Uh, you know, Malcolm Thorns tournaments. Um, so yeah, so and there was Leeds as well, and it was sort of every weekend. Then by the time I was fourteen, fifteen, you're looking for a sort of a national national tournament to go in. But it was sort of it was tough from sort of going winning a, a local um, junior sort of tournament every Saturday morning. It was such a massive jump to go then see the standard nationwide. You know, I sort of grew up with Tom Ford, Mark Selby, you know, they're sim- same age as me. Yeah. And, the, and it was just, you know, you unbelievable sort of jumping class, really. Did you watch a lot of snooker growing up, Mark? Uh, yeah. Um, Jimmy White was my, um, my, my sort of idol, if you like, yeah. uh, growing up. Um, yeah, still remember all the world finals. I think actually uh, probably in tears. The, the Heartbreak. One- yeah. One where he lost in the uh, in the decider, eighteen seventeen. Still, re- still remember that one there. But um, yeah, like I say, if it weren't for, weren't for Jimmy White, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't be talking to you now. Uh, what other sports were you into as well as a youngin? Because I know that you're a, you're a golf fan and a and a football fan. Yeah, big big Man United fan. Um, big game today, man. Big game against uh, Arsenal. Five thirty kick off. Yeah, yeah, we need to bounce back after uh, after the result against Sheffield the other night. But um, yeah, I mean, like I say, to be honest, yeah, everyone's talking about us winning the league. I think you know we're still a two or three players short of that. But um, six sitting second, I didn't think a lot of people would have thought uh, that you'd be second at this stage of the league. I don't think this uh, this time. No, I mean, like it's only a few months ago where we was sort of fifteenth, no. um, and then obviously we've gone on gone on a cracking run over Christmas and the New Year. And um, yeah, I th- like I said, I think uh, I think Ollie's doing a good job. I think yeah. we need to still get rid of a bit of dead wood in the club, um, and you know, probably another two or three world class signings away from from really, you know, mounting a sustained challenge. If you like, you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. I still think the, I still think I still think if we finish top four and get Champions League football, that'll be a a decent season, to be honest. Definitely. Maybe, maybe, maybe win a cup as well, and not losing the semi like we uh, we've done for the last <laughs> five eighteen months. Yeah. Are you um, are, are you good at golf? Golf. Um, I was actually a member at, uh, at my local course just um, before Barry Earn took over the game because we obviously I turned professional in two thousand and six, mm. and um, we only had sort of six, seven, eight tournaments a year for the first five years. I was pro. Um, so you, we, you know, I had that much spare time on my hands. So I thought I've got to, I've got to do something else. So I actually joined a local, um, a local golf course, uh, golf club. Um, and I think I sort of got my handicap down to about probably about twelve or thirteen, nice. something like that. Um, but at the minute, I mean, I probably have like six or seven rounds a year at the minute. You know, because with that, with that sort of busy. Yeah. And obviously, when you've got family and kids as well, it's it's tough to find the time. You know, it's sort of it's an all day affair, isn't it? Golf. 
Um, it's not something you can just pop out and have an hour at. You know, you you end four or five hours around, and then you have a couple of beers after, and you, yeah. well, you know, it's a seven eight hour job. But um, yeah, I think at the minute I'll probably be playing to around the twenty mark. Mm. You know, but as I said, when I was playing regular, my short game was a little bit better. <laughs> so you had um you had an outstanding amateur career. Uh, Mark, yeah. you know, winning the European Under-19 Championship, the English Open, the English Amateur Championship. You know, to win with, um, they're unbelievably tough to win, especially with all the talent, the, the talent that's about. Yeah, um, I suppose you could argue um, with, the, with the amateur career I've had, I've probably not really done myself justice mm. at professional level. I think that would be a fair comment to make. Um, but yeah, uh, like you say, um, I won the English Open in 2005. Well, before that, European Under-19 yeah. champion 2001. Lost in the final the following year. Um, and then uh, won the English Open 2005. And, and uh, the, the same year I qualified for the main tour off the, off the yeah. play. It was the BIOS back then. Yeah. The um, it was like, a, it was like a, a feeder tour for the main tour. And you finished um, fifth. You finished fifth, wasn't it? In the... Was it fifth, was it? I was going to yeah. say it was fourth fourth or fifth but that that year i qualified for the main tour i actually i won the english english amateur um so that was a fantastic way to sort of cap off your your amateur career if you like i mean that must have been um uh i know it's obviously to get your tour card must be great but it's a monumental moment in a player's career to go from an amateur to be recognized as a professional in your kind of chosen field i mean not a lot of people get the chance to do that yeah i think uh I think it's just something you, I'm not going to say you expect to do it, but um, maybe maybe you don't really sort of appreciate it at the time. Yeah. You just, you kind of just expect it to happen. Um, but I think at the time as well, it was, although you sort of classed as professional, I think the game was in such a, a bad, bad state. It almost felt like, you, you wasn't a professional really, if you know what I mean. Yeah. We only, like I said earlier, we, we only had, I think I don't know if it was the first year I played on the tour or the second year. We only had six tournaments, um, yeah. you know. And unless you unless you had a good UK or world or well both both UK and world, um, you know you. And obviously now you have a two year card as well. Whereas back then it was just you got to perform for that season, otherwise you're off. Yeah. Uh, and there was no Q school or a chance to bounce straight back. You don't you you know you had to have a year out of the game. Um, luckily for me, I've, when I turned professional, I've been on the tour 15 consecutive years. Mm. Is it, I don't know if this is my 16th consecutive year or 15th, I'm not sure, but I never actually dropped off, which is, yeah. again, you know, quite a good achievement, really. I mean, you've mentioned the first few years being tough. I mean, I've spoke to other snooker players who have said that who have been around while there was only the six or seven tournaments like we mentioned um and then obviously barry came on and, and, and kind of blew blew all the competitions up and i remember when like you said there used to be the, the the world final was on then there would be such a big wait and even people went over to america to do the nine ball and stuff like that um and then like you say if you didn't do well in those six or seven competitions if you didn't run deep you're always yeah. kind of struggling to stay back so the fact that you've been able to stay consecutively uh, on the tour um, it's, de it's, it's, it's definitely a big achievement. There must be something you're proud of, without a doubt. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did get a little bit lucky the first season, I remember. Um, in the World Championships, I think I needed to win a couple of matches to, to keep my um, to keep my card, because it was it was different back then. Now, now obviously, it's a prize money list back then. It was, yeah. it was a ranking point schedule, um, and it, it rewarded more consistency in sort of winning your first round matches. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the points, there was a big points jump if you won your first round match. Whereas now, um, you could argue it's almost better to have three or four first round losses and, and have one one big hit. Yes, you know, in, in, in terms of jumping up the rankings. But that wasn't the case uh, back then. Uh, but going into the world in my first year, I think I needed to win two matches, and I won my first match. And the second match, I was I was due to play uh, Robin Hall. Um, from Finland, and I, on my way out of Pontins, I remember um, somebody running after me and saying, um, "One of the I can't remember if it was Mark Ganley or Martin Clark want, wants to speak to you in the office." I thought, you know, what have I done? <laughs> I thought I'd done something wrong, and now uh, I've gone in. He's gone. Oh, uh, Robin Hall's withdrawn. Uh, we've he had some sort of health condition, 
and that gave me a walkover in my second match. Um, and that that actually kept me on the tour, I think. It might have kept me on through the one-year list. Um, but after that, uh, yeah, sort of got in the 64 and just sort of gradually sort of worked my way up the rankings. You're like making it to the final of uh, qualifying a few times and then, um, you know, you, you played um, in the UK Championships. You almost qualified in the, the Masters in 2009, losing out to Judd Trump in the, the final qualifying stage. But you were, like you've just mentioned there, you were gradually moving up up through and through the rankings with uh, with every with every tournament really yeah um like yeah, obviously like you say 2008 um there we, we there was it used to be a masters qualifying tournament um so obviously you get the top 16 um straight to the venue and then there was a uh, everybody else uh, thrown in the pot winner takes all kind of thing i think i ended up winning six 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 matches maybe that week yeah. um at the english institute of sport in sheffield and they ended up losing to a young Judd Trump in the final. Um, and it was it was like such a big game for both of us. I probably just bottled it a little bit, to be honest. You know what I mean? Probably just let the occasion get to me a little bit of what was at stake. Um, instead of just playing the game that had sort of got me to that position all week. Yeah. Um, but it was literally, you know, there was no sort of prize money involved. In fact, I think by the end of it, I'd probably finished down. You know, it was like sort of... Everything was riding on winning the tournament, uh, and in the end, I probably won about five hundred quid, which was <laughs> about covered my expenses, you know. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. I mean, over the years, I've had a few, uh, few, few good wins, a uh, couple of quarterfinals in the UK. Um, I think it's it's just um, it's just a matter of trying to find that level of consistency to, you know, consistently produce week in week out, which is. Um, you know, obviously what the top players do, the ranking list is it's a list of consistency. All the players on the tour, fantastic players, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Um, but the top players are just super consistent. You know, they're, every time they get the queue out, that you know they're going to play to a certain level. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, what we're all trying to uh, achieve, really. You um you qualified for the television stages of the UK Championship for the first time in your career, beating Steve Davis in the final final qualifying. You'd also beat Ali Carter, Judd Trump, uh, nine seven in the yeah. last sixteen. Now that must have been a massive confidence boost. Must have been. Yeah. Um, obviously, like you say, I'd actually just dropped out of the sixty four at the time as mm. well, and I come into the first qualifying round, and um, I won four qualifiers at. Um, uh, again, uh, the English Institute of Sport, which is where everything was being played at that, that sort of time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember a third qualifying match, I was 8-5 down to Marcus Campbell and um, somehow managed to win the last four to win 9-8. And then I was up first thing the next morning to play Steve Davis in the final qualifier. Um, and I think I was just still buzzing from the night before. I, I, I played really well. I think I won 9-2, I think it was. Um, and, and to be fair, Davis was still playing all right at that time as well. I think he'd just got to the quarters of the world mm. uh, only a few months uh, previous. Um, but yeah, I mean, like obviously uh, at that point, you're just delighted to qualify. Um, and the tournament was actually held in Telford, which is only sort of 20 minutes from, from where I live. So it was like a local tournament to me as well. Um, but yeah, obviously I had Ali Carter first, first round in Telford and, I think he was world number two at the time. Um, and, yeah, but no expectation. I think I just went in there match sharp. I just had four best of seven, you know, they were best of 17s yeah. at, that, at that time. I just had four best of 17, 17s under my belt. And I just went there feeling match sharp, really. So it didn't really matter who I played. Yeah. And uh, yeah, nine, nine six victory over Ali, and then um, yeah. you get, and then you play, you play Judd next, and I bet it was, uh, yeah, and that was in the last sixteen. So you didn't, you definitely didn't have an easy route to <laughs> on your way through that. Yeah, um, Judd, yeah, I play. I remember playing Judd. Uh, it was because it was just before we broke through. I think six mm. months later, he, he won the China and and um, got to the final of the World Championships. Um, but we played on one of the back tables in, back in Telford, um, and it, we had a, it was a cracking match. Um, I think I was five three up after the first session, and then 
he come back to 6-5 in front. And I remember, the, I think the frame before the interval was a big game. If he'd have gone 7-5, I think he'd have probably won. But I, mm. I, I managed to go 6 each. And then he went 7-6 in front. And then I pulled three breaks out from nowhere to win 9-7. Um, mm. And then I, I was in the quarterfinal then against Mark Williams. I actually played Judd Trump in 2012 as well. Yeah. Um, so I beat him in 2010 and 12, and he, he won it in 2011. So I beat him either side of the year he won it. But the match in 2012, were, yeah, that, that wasn't a very good match, to be honest. He, uh, he sort of chucked that one away, if, yeah. in all fairness. But the, the one in Telford was a cracking match. So the year after, um, after you'd kind of um, you'd moved up 16 places up to world number uh, 42, I think it was, so you won the pink ribbon. Um, the following season, and although you'd moved up the the rankings, you still had to kind of play two, and then it was three qualifying rounds just to make it um, onto the TV. Now, I think what some people don't realise, especially people who watch it at home, is just how tough it is um, to to kind of get to the TV stages. People who just kind of watch snooker at home um, on the TV, they don't realise that how many matches that you kind of have to go through just to make it onto these, um, on, yeah, there's a very limited number of places for the people on the TV, and the amount of people vying for those places is crazy. So uh, to, to make it onto the TV stages at any time, people don't realise just how tough it is. Yeah, and again, it was it was a different um, sort of system back then as well. So like now you've got the flat draws, you've got 128 players, and everyone's coming in at round one. Obviously, back then it was it was staggered, it's a bit like the world is now, where you've got the top sixteen guaranteed to the venue, and then you've got another sixteen places available for the rest of the tour. Which um, I'm not sure if the tour had been expanded to one, two, eight at that point. But you know, even if it, if it was ninety six, you still got eighty players yeah. going to the qualifiers, trying to trying to get sixteen spots. You know, and uh, as you say, it's very very tough, very tough to get through the qualifiers. Well, um, you finished the 2012-13 season, uh, world number two, uh, 42, after a good run at the UK Championship, beating Andy Hicks, Jamie Corp, injured Trump again, as we mentioned. Uh, you also yeah. had a very consistent season with the PDC events, uh, moving you up to, to, the, to the 42 in the world, but you pulled out of the China Open uh, due to uh, uh, your partner giving birth. Um, how did that affect your game, having a little one? Um... Yeah, it's uh, obviously it's something completely new, isn't it, at the time? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is probably just um, lack of sleep, and you know your whole sort of sleeping patterns completely, um, you know, out of sync. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I think you know my wife; she's been very, very, very good with the kids. We um, we've got twins now as well. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, again, when when the twins come along, that was that was probably even tougher. You know, I mean, the, the, our first child, Luke, he he, uh, he was he was he was very good sleeper. In, yeah. You know, in compared in comparison to to having twins. <laughs> they always say that if one child's um, a good sleeper, then the next one's going to be kind of the polar opposite. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the twins was tough because, um, well, you know, obviously. Apart from being a massive shock to find out you're having twins, but um, um, they actually they were they were born two months premature as well. Um, so um, the first sort of month after they were born, um, we were having to commute from from where I live to Birmingham, um, the the children's hospital over there. Um, uh, so that's sort of like a forty minute journey. Yeah there and back every day to see them and you know they're three they're tiny you know three pound five four pound two when they were born so they were just they were unbelievably small and fragile and um yeah just a scary sort of scary experience really and obviously then you've got i'm trying to juggle practicing and getting to tournaments and you feel guilty going to tournaments as well and you know that was a that was that was probably a much tougher time than as i say with the first one yeah. But um, I mean, after the first one, uh, whatever, you know, lack of sleep, but it seemed to work because you had a great one at the quarters of, of the World Open. You know, you beat Barry Hawkins uh, from 4-2 down, Kurt Mafflin, and unfortunately lost out to Mark Ofu. But you must, must have been, uh, you must have been fitting some practice in, or was it just the fact that you had no sleep at all, that you thought, you know, you were just an autopilot? Uh, which tournament was that again, sorry? Um, it was the... 
but the world opened. The, the world opened, yeah. The world opened, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. That was in um, that was in Haiku on the little little island. Uh, that was just a fantastic place to be. I think it's it was it. more like a it was more like a holiday than a. There was nobody watching. It was just sort of some remote island just off the um, south coast of China, near oh. to Hong Kong. But it was. Uh, I think it's where all the Chinese go on holiday, and it was it was just beautiful out there. Is that one of the best um, places you've ever? Is that one of the best places you've ever played in? I was going to say. I think it's, so. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, it was just like a holiday resort, and the the venue and the hotel was fantastic. Um, so it was kind of like just a nice place to be. So maybe, maybe that was the reason why I played well. <laughs> in um in the 2015 2016 um season, you beat um. Mark Allen a few times, and um, one of which was a run to the German Masters quarterfinals. Uh, after the Northern Ireland Open, he was um, he was very vocal about you in an interview. Now, this was quite a few years ago now, so is that all kind of, is that all water under the bridge now? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we speak to each yeah. other now, so I think it was just, uh, it was just something that happened at the time. Yeah. Obviously, I think um, I'd probably beat him three or four, uh, three or four times, on the spin maybe and uh obviously i drew drawn him first round in belfast and uh i don't know maybe it's just sort of mind a bit of mind games maybe i'm not sure at the um at the china open in 2017 you played ronnie on tv now an obvious crowd favorite uh you make a 137 total clearance on the way to a 5-4 victory uh do you agree with other players that i've spoken to mark that they say that a lot of players lose the match even before kind of striking a ball against someone like ronnie um yeah i think uh i think you're right i think um sort of probably back in the 80s i think the same could be said when players used to come up against Davis and probably Hendry in the nineties, and you know, at the end of the day, snooker is a game as skillful as it as it is. I think it's it's a very mental game as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if you sort of uh, if you if you start playing and you don't believe you can win, then you're not going to win. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I've played Ronnie a couple of times. The first time I played on telly, I actually played Ronnie. Um, uh, I think it was 2007 at the Grand Prix um, and just playing on the TV is just a completely different kettle of fish to, to playing on the uh, the qualifiers. Mm. Uh, I don't think it would have mattered who would have played that day, to be honest. It was just the whole uh, occasion just got to me, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, I think, you know, when I played him in 2017, obviously 10 years later, you were... Uh, I've been on the main tour a long time at that point, played a lot of matches and I think you've just got to get to a point where you just sort of concentrate on playing the table and the balls, you know. I think it, it, first couple of seasons on the main tour, I played like Jimmy, who was my idol growing up and players like John Parrott and players like that. And I think I was probably guilty of playing the name, if you like. Legends of the um, game, the le legends of the game. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but I think... Um, you know, you, after after a couple of years on the tour, you get to a point then where you think, you know, you you, you can't afford to do that, otherwise you're going to get beat. So, <laughs> yeah. You beat um, Dave Gilbert and Neil Robertson on the way to um, another UK quarter final um, as well. Another another really strong season. Yeah, uh, that was a, a missed opportunity, to be honest. Um, obviously. Um, Played some cracking snooker up in New York that week. Um, the Robertson game was, well, the Gilbert game was a cracking game. The Robertson game just managed to hold myself together to clear up and win 6-5. Um, and then ended up losing in the decider to Ryan Day in the quarters. And um, yeah, that was that was one which, you know, I look back on and think, you know, I should have really converted that one in. The way I was playing, I probably, I probably should have been a little bit more aggressive during the match um, and I went into my shell a, li a little bit trying not to lose instead of playing to win because Ryan was struggling a little bit and he was there for I felt like he was there for the taking and like if I could play the match back now I'd definitely be more aggressive mm -hmm. um, and then I remember having a chance in the decider and I was probably too aggressive in the decider where well, I should have been aggressive, more aggressive during the match and probably a little bit more cagey in the decider. I went a little bit too aggressive in the decider, you know, and, and for the majority of the game, I was 
you know, like like I said, trying not to lose instead of going out there trying to win. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask if he had any regrets, but uh, so you think that's probably one of the the ones that stick in your mind the most? Yeah, I think there's been a few. Um, I've had a few quarterfinals and a few narrow defeats. Um, I think uh, the German Masters, uh, the Temper Drum, three or four years ago, I lost in a decider to Luca Brussel in the uh, five four. That was another missed opportunity, to be honest. I think I was four two up in that match as well. Um, and I had chances to win 5-2 and 5-3 and quite often the way you miss your chance to to win the game and then I didn't really see a ball in the in the, in the last frame he knocked a good I think he knocked a, a long red in a mid-100 um, but that was an opportunity missed to get to the one table set up at the Temper Drone um, so yeah So the Riga Masters in uh, 2019 you make it to the final I mean after some uh, great matches along the way so what was the experience of um of, uh, of that competition uh, quite recently uh, for you. I mean, obviously, Yan, Yan Bing Tao is uh, an obviously a massively up-and-coming player, but that must have been a great uh, achievement personally for yourself to kind of make it to that to that ranking final. Yeah, um, again, uh, I, obviously, I think the, was it maybe the year before I got to the final or two years before I lost to Mark Williams in the, I think it might have been the quarters yeah. or... Um, so I think it was just a venue and a city which, um, you know, all, I think all the players sort of enjoy going to, to be honest, Love, lovely city. Um, and yeah, um, obviously gone there in good form because I've just won the Vienna a month before, yeah. a couple of months before. Um, and I'd won my first couple of qualifying matches of the season. So I was look, obviously looking forward to going to Riga. And uh, managed to play some really, really good stuff out there. So uh, yeah, like you say, in the final against Bingtown, um, I think the I think the first frame. I, I don't know if you watched you watched any yeah. of the game, but I think the, the first frame was the was the turning point. At the time, you don't always realise what a turning point is, but you know um, it can happen. It back, can happen that early. Yeah, it can happen that early. It can happen that early. And, yeah. and I think in I think in that match, um, he needed a snooker in the first game. And I played a I played a poor shot, um, and I ended up oh, I can't remember. I think I ended up hitting the blue or something. There was the, uh, anyway. I ended up nicking it on the black, and um, that sort of rocked me for the next game, if you like, where because he was under pressure at the time. And I thought if I could win the first frame, keep him under pressure, get off to a good start, but it kind of worked the other way. I threw the first frame away, and then he put me under pressure, and um, he got off to the good start. And um, best of five, best best of nines. You you need to go off to a good start. So that kind of that first frame happening the way it happened, you're thinking instead of being ahead and putting him under pressure, you've kind of yeah. now found yourself on the back foot trying to kind of claw that frame back just to try to just to get it to one all. But exactly, and you know you could you could see he come out the second frame and he, he looked at if you know he's hitting the ball more solid and excuse me, you could see he was he was a different player to what he was in the first game. So. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously we'll never know. But if I if I could have won that first frame, it would have been, I think. Uh, to be honest, I think I think I'd have won the match. Do you? Um, I mean, you've been on the tour. You've played for a long, long time, Mark. Do you? Do you still practice quite a lot? Um, and uh, you know, how many hours would you say that you tried to put in? I mean, I know you've got little ends and twins, but uh, do you yeah. still do you still enjoy practicing? Do you still like? Um, do you still enjoy putting the work in? Because I know a lot of snooker players. You yeah. know, sometimes they just get bored of uh, of all the practice. Yeah, I mean. <sighs> I still enjoy playing games against other players and I still love traveling and going to the tournaments. Um, I would probably say that the solo stuff definitely gets harder to do as you get older. Yeah. Um, but it's something that you, you know, you, you need to do, you know, it's, um, it's something you need to do because if you don't do it, then you sort of go into frames and you might not quite be as sharp and it can be sort of a vicious cycle, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, so it's 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 a bit of a balancing act, I think. You've got to get the right balance between the solo stuff, the and and and, and the playing games against other players. So, Mark, what do you do when you're away from the table, mate? How do you relax? I mean, I've got to, again. I know you've got little ones, but do you ever get a time to just kind of Netflix and chill? <laughs> Not really, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, no, it's pretty it's pretty pretty hard, really. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I come and do my practice, and then you go home and sort the kids out and. Uh, obviously, like the twins, try and get the twins to bed reasonably early. But then you've got the elder one to, to sort of 
um, to deal with. He doesn't like going to bed. He thinks he should be going to bed the same time as you. Um, so that that's tough. But um, yeah, on the odd occasion, um, we sort of get get the kids to bed. Then, but probably just watch a film or uh, you know, I, I love my sport, so I'm probably yeah. probably just lying in the bed watching the watching the watching the footy or something. And uh, what foods are you into? Foods. Um, I like I like spicy food. I like Indian foods, um, Chinese, anything really. I'm not 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 too fussy. I was talking to Louis Heathcote yesterday, and Louis was saying that he likes these Indians, but he can't have them. He said he's working his way up spicy, but he can't have them too spicy. I'm the same. I can't. I mean, I know I've got friends of mine who can kind of eat fowls and drink the, the sauce out of them. I don't know how people manage to do that in a million years. But uh, are you more like a, a medium, or do you like like something a bit spicier? Uh, yeah, I've got to have a bit of spice, but um, I think um, I actually had a, had a curry a couple of nights ago, and, and uh, Madras is my level. Um, so, yeah, anything else other than the Madras is just it's, it's, it's too much. So, uh, yeah, that's my limit. And uh, what, uh, what's your favourite drink? Drink, yeah. What, what, normal or alcoholic, <laughs> or both? Uh, but, but uh, go for both. <laughs> no, well, I, uh, ooh, I drink a lot of coffee. Yeah. Uh, I think that's more of a habit than anything else, to be honest. Um, but during the day, if I'm practicing, drink quite a lot of coffee. Yeah. Uh, bottles of water. Um, alcoholic. I've, a couple of friends of mine. They've got um, like one of these micro pubs, um, and I've always sort of had a, a drank lager, but. Um, the last couple of years, he's, my friends have got me on the the, the, the craft aisles. Nice. Um, so uh, yeah, I've kind of I've been ordering them online during the lockdown, and yeah, they're quite nice. I've been doing that. Uh, I like you say I've got. I used to go out and just have like a car and, and stuff like that. But lately, I've been doing more like the craft deals, and I've been even going along like the IPAs and trying yeah, just yeah. trying the different types and stuff. And it's much more enjoyable to have like maybe. I'm not going to say how many bottles, but to have different ones that you can try than just kind of the, the same drink over and over. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, lager just sort of blows you up, doesn't it? Mm. Um, whereas I've been I've been ordering from a, a, brew, a microbrewery down in South Wales, and um, yeah, some of their beers are lovely. You know, nice like the tropical ones, and yeah. I'll have to get. I'll have to get a. Uh, I'll have to get the email address off them on the website off you afterwards, and uh, I'll yeah, write, write, order some in. So, where's your favourite holiday destination? Well, well, when we're open, fortunately, unfortunately, we're not at the moment. But when we are, where where do you like to go? Oh, um, I, I quite like Lanzarote. Been there, been there quite a few times. Um, uh, well, the Canaries in general, really. Yeah. But um, yeah, probably the yeah, the Canaries, probably Lanzarote is my favourite. Puerto del Carmen, quite quite like it there. Just unfortunately, we can't get anything booked at the moment. No, um, yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare, isn't it? What's going on, obviously, but um, yeah, might just have to settle for the uh, holiday in the UK this year. So you've got the uh, the shootout is coming up next week, mate. You play Andrew Higginson. Uh, now you do have um, experience playing in it, so you know. Do you like the format, and how do you feel having no crowds going to kind of affect the kind of affect the dynamic of the competition? Um, I'm glad you didn't bring my record up into it then. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not, <laughs> not been my best, um, best uh, event over the last few years, to be fair. But having said that, I've always enjoyed playing in the tournament. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it'll be totally different this year because, um, obviously it's the only tournament we have where you have the sort of crowd interaction. Um, but yeah, so going down to Milton Keynes with no one, no one watching, it'll be a bit strange. I'm not used to seeing Phil Seymour trying to get a, a Mexican wave around there, and there's going to be none of that going on. No, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I weren't sure if the tournament would be going ahead because I'm, you know, I didn't think personally, I didn't think it'd work without the fans because yeah. uh, it's the fans that sort of create the atmosphere, isn't it? Um, that's well, why yeah. I thought. That's why I thought I'd ask you, being a professional and being there and being in it and seeing it yourself, yeah, uh, yeah, having yeah. experience. Yeah, it's one of those tournaments. So every time I play in it, I come off and say, oh, "I'm not. I'm not, definitely not going to play in it next year. Definitely not going to play in it." And then when the entry pack comes out, you end up. You end up. I end up entering it. Um, but yeah, listen. You know, it is what it is. It's a bit of fun. I think you've got to go there and just treat it as a bit of fun. And. Um, like I said, it'd be nice just to win a match because I think I probably only won a couple of matches there in about 
seven or eight years. So, you know, uh, every match is a bonus for me in that tournament. Do you um do you set yourself goals for the season, Mark? Um yeah, I think so. I think it's important to set goals. Um probably you know, like short term goals and long term goals. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um like I said, this 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 season my goal was to try and get in the top thirty two by the end of the season. I think at the minute I'm um projected to finish around forty two at the minute. Um so I Obviously, I've got four or five tournaments left, so um, hopefully, I can have a good running in in in, in one of them. Yeah. And obviously, you need to have a good world as well with the with the prize money available in the world. Yeah. And what's your uh, like? You say you've you've got a long term goal. What's that one? Uh, long term goal is to obviously win a tournament. Um, nearly got there, like obviously as we we're talking about in in Riga a couple of years ago. Um, so you know, I, re- I, I, I really feel it's there in the locker. Yes. Um, it's just trying to bring out your sort of practice form on a given week, and you know, you need that little bit of luck as well. Um, I've actually played in the Scottish just before Christmas, and I felt really good about my game, playing quite consistent. Um, and I've run into Mark Salby in the last thirty-two, um, and you know, a couple of shots here and there. And he, beat, he ended up beating me four two. But you know, I, I thought if I could just get past Selby, that, that could have been, you know, that could have been my week as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, more often than not, you find yourself up against a, a top player, um, and it, it's tough to beat him, particularly on the TV table when um, you know they, they play pretty much every every game on the TV. It's almost it's almost like the practice table. You know, so it's um, it's tough when you've been out the back all week and then all of a sudden you put onto the TV table. Yeah. And not only that, you're playing more often than not a top top four, top top six player in the world. So, look, Mark, um, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on on a Saturday, taking some time to come out and have a little bit of a chat. Um, good luck at the shootout. I know the shootout's coming up and uh, all the best for the rest Maybe. of the season. <laughs> okay, mate. Thanks Cheers, for asking me. No worries, bye. Yeah.